Good morning and welcome to the Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce and to today's webinar on diffusing the COVID debt bomb. I hope you can all hear me. Um, I can see we still have quite a few people um, that will be joining us. Um, so I'll give it a, a one more minute and um, yeah, we'll just wait for people to, to join. Um, I hope you can hear me. If you can, please just um, post in the chat box. That's perfect. Thank you, Penny. This will be um, on voice only, so there will be no video um, of us presenting today. So we'll be talking over the slides. Okay. Still people joining. Okay, we're going to start now. Um, so I'm Narinda Multani, Account Manager here at the Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce. Today's webinar will be delivered by our member, James Hawksworth and Mark Holborn of RSM UK. Um, so this webinar is being recorded and will be available to listen to again via our Chamber Library. So that's um, on the Chamber website under the event section. Um, so you can listen to it again and you can share the link amongst your team if you um, want them to also listen to it. So I'm going to now um, pass you over to um, James and he will commence with today's webinar. Uh, if you do have any questions, please post them in the, the chat box and James and Mark will answer those for you as, as we go along. Um, so over to, to James, I'm just going to give um, remote control access. So just bear with us. Wonderful. Okay. Good morning, James. Good morning, Narinda. And a huge thank you for the intro and, and for inviting Mark Holbro and I to speak about diffusing the COVID debt bomb and navigating through the post-pandemic recovery. Uh, and good morning to everyone who's on the call. Uh, appreciate you joining us virtually this morning from wherever you're based. Um, as mentioned by Narinda, you can ask questions in the chat box as we go through, and we'll try to pick up uh, some of these as we go through the presentation. Uh, and we'll answer any remaining questions at the end of the presentation. And apologies, I know it's frustrating. We've got our cameras off this morning, but uh, because the session is being recorded, we've been told that having the cameras on interferes with the recording so um so we've got the, the, the cameras off uh, but you'll be delighted to be able to see our our uh, smiling faces there on the screen to, so you know who who it is that is speaking to you this morning so i'm the chap on the left um my name is james hawksworth uh i'm an accountant and insolvency practitioner and i've been working in restructuring and distress turnaround uh, and insolvency for about 20 years or so now uh, i qualified as an accountant and insolvency practitioner uh, at Deloitte in London during 11 years with those guys before moving to Reading and joining RSM to lead the restructuring offering in the Thames Valley and the South West. And for those of you that aren't aware, RSM is a full service accountancy firm and we specialise in the mid-market space and owner managed businesses. So I'm also joined by my colleague Mark Holbro, who's the picture on the right. So over to you, Mark, for a brief intro. Morning all. Yes, similar to James, I've been working in this business for a uh, better part of 15, 16 years now. I trained with PwC, so up in London, um, and now cover the southeast region for RSM. So uh, working on, on owner-managed businesses, but all around restructuring insolvency side of things. Brilliant. So thanks, Mark. So today we're going to talk to you about the key considerations that businesses will have emerging from the pandemic and you can see here the agenda we'll start by talking you through the current landscape and what we think might be around the corner we'll give our thoughts on what your key stakeholders might be prioritizing as the economy recovers and we'll then look at what's in our toolkit to help you to avoid pitfalls and navigate through the financial damage that's been caused by covid and finally we'll pull together what we feel are the key points in the summary at the end so the first section is the restructuring climate 
and what we are currently seeing and what is just around the corner. So on this next slide, um, we can have a quick look at where we are now. So as you'll have appreciated, the last year or so has been a huge journey for the economy and it, it left 2020 showing the largest drop in GDP for 300 years, unsurprisingly, given what had gone on. And the government stepped up and put in place a, an impressive array of protections and support, the like of which we'd never seen before. Uh, government backed business loans, um, business interruption loans of over £75 billion pounds, uh, flushed into the economy. Uh, the tax man was told to allow extensive VAT deferrals amounting to over £33 billion. Pounds. And controversially, it was made impossible for landlords to evict tenants for non-payment or for anybody to wind up companies. And that gave rise to deferred rent payments of well over £7 billion and rising. So what else are we seeing? Well, the business interruption loans have now finished, as you know, and the recovery loan scheme has replaced it. Unfortunately, the RLS is less attractive than its counterpart and the take up has been very slow. Mark will touch on this later in the presentation. Uh, we're also seeing HMRC um, starting to ask for repayment of sums due to them, uh, albeit they are still flexible uh, in terms of repayment terms, providing the messaging is, is right with them. And finally, we're see, beginning to see the impact of Brexit, and that's definitely making lives harder for companies at the moment. Uh, companies which import or export products or components with Europe are seeing some additional costs, delays and supply issues. And it's also making life harder for businesses which rely on staff which had previously come from abroad, which is something which has contributed to the issue we are seeing in the haulage sector, for example. So what's around the corner? Well, having taken a battering over the last year, the economy is set for the fastest growth since World War II, as you can see from, from the hockey stick on this graph. The recent wave of the virus uh, has shown us that businesses have learned to become more resilient to lockdowns. So we saw a far smaller retraction in output during the second lockdown late last year than compared to the first lockdown. In the first lockdown, uh, the worst hit sector shrank by at least 25%, um, whereas all hectares, sectors have, have, have held up much better in the second lockdown with the comparative reductions of only 8%. So that's certainly a good sign for the economies if there are to be any future lockdowns as we emerge from the pandemic. But obviously we sincerely hope there won't be. Um, and we, we think that for the short term, at least HMRC will continue to show some forbearance. And, and as I said earlier, a little bit of flexibility. And we also feel that banks are, are going to continue to remain broadly supportive and will not be taking an overly aggressive start with stance with clients. Um, the much vaunted Freedom Day passed in June uh, and signaled that lockdown was coming to an end. Um, and with the strong vaccination drive, there is real hope that we might just be able to hold on to our newfound freedoms for a little while longer. And obviously there's a lot of political pressure as well uh, against having another lockdown. So there's a very real prospect of significant upside for the business, for businesses as the economy bounces back, providing they can navigate their through for the coming six to 12 months. And as you can see here, planning really will be key because unfortunately there will be some difficult times ahead for businesses. Most protections are falling away in the near term, having been extended on several occasions, as you can see on this slide. So protections for directors have fallen away already, and that means they are susceptible to potential personal liability from wrongful trading as of the 1st of July. And that com combines with the, the risk of personal liability for VAT debts if they've been involved with um, two insolvent companies previously. Uh, so that's another risk um, for them to be aware of. Creditors, including HMRC, will also be able to wind up companies from the 1st of October leading to more pressure on cash. And the furlough scheme, as we know, will be ceasing on the 30th of September. CGRS will be, will be ceasing at that point, having tapered down, and that will lead to difficult decisions for some employers. And finally, landlords will also be able to threaten to forfeit leases of slow paying tenants from the 1st of April, 2022, albeit they'll start to be able to apply pressure from the 1st of October, uh, in, in light of the, um, the situation with winding up petitions. We do expect some legislation to be introduced, uh, which might mean that landlords will be unable to wind up tenants for, for arrears of rent um, from the 1st of October, so that something will come in to bridge the gap from the 1st of October to the 1st of April. So in terms of what we're likely to see, one consideration is the impact that the 
support schemes have had. So they have helped, absolutely they've helped, but in part, they've also kicked, kicked the can down the road a little. Um, as you can see with the graph on the left, um, the blue, light blue bars uh, represent the number of insolvencies per quarter in 2019. And 2019 was a very normal year. There wasn't many, there weren't many insolvencies in that year. Um, but you can see in Q2 2020, which is the, uh, the, the, the gray bar on the chart, in Q2, that's, that, that, the number of insolvencies fell starkly, and that fall was mirrored in Q3 and Q4, and then in the green blocks, you can see it was still very low in Q1 2021, and Q2 2021 still hasn't returned to what would be a normal level. Now, the reduction in insolvencies is primarily down to the measures we, measure, we mentioned earlier, those uh, protective legislations, and therefore there's, there's a large number of companies which would ordinarily have fallen by the wayside in a normal trading environment, which are only surviving due to the legislation which has been passed. And that legislation is now falling away. So you are going to start to see, I'm sorry to say, a catch up in insolvencies over the next couple of years. And zombie companies falling over is going to be an issue because that is bound to have a ripple effect. And the two graphs on the right with the red bars show you that it isn't only the UK which will be experiencing increasing numbers of insolvency. This will be a global phenomenon. The graph in the middle of the page shows the reduction in insolvencies in 2020 by country, and you see the UK circled in blue there with a 27% reduction in that year. Um, and the table on the right shows the increase in insolvencies anticipated as we exit the pandemic, with UK insolvencies increasing by 56%. Uh, this, this prediction has been pushed back slightly because of all the protective legislation has been pushed back, but we still anticipate that, that increase. And the key relevance of this for you is that the ripple effect of high numbers of insolvencies will make trading less predictable and bad debts more prevalent, making it even more important to plan for the coming year. So I'll now hand you over to Mark, who will help your planning by running through your key stakeholders and what we think they will be prioritising as we exit the pandemic. Um, so as, as James says, um, just to run you through some of the key stakeholders, what we're seeing from them at the moment, what's really kind of driving their behaviours. Um, the ones we're going to cover off, landlords, HMRC, trade suppliers, the workforce and then secured lenders. Um, this is obviously sort of the general themes that we're seeing across these uh, the conversations we're having, the businesses we're working with. So every situation will be judged on its own merits and, and on its own specific circumstances, but hopefully this will give uh, some, some view and some guidance to you. First up, the landlords. Um, landlords have had an incredibly tough time over the last kind of 18 months or so, and really I have quite a lot of sympathy for them. Um, the messages from the government at the start of the pandemic essentially said landlords aren't allowed to forfeit leases, you can't throw your commercial tenants out, you also can't pursue the rent through any of the legal kind of uh, procedures they have. So you can't pursue CRA, you can't pursue winding up petitions. And it was taken as kind of a tacit, uh, a tacit statement that you simply didn't have to pay your rent during the pandemic if you couldn't afford it. But it's a legal debt and it is a legal lease. So landlords were essentially put in a position where they had no option. They had no, um, they had no power of the situation and no additional support. And that's really been seen throughout the pandemic because um, fi the Financial Times, for example, has, has looked at this and estimates that around 30% of, re of commercial rent hasn't been paid during the course of the pandemic. So that's where our kind of £7 billion figure comes from. It's a huge problem and it is continuing. So in the last quarter, in the June quarter, about 50% of leisure businesses or sorry, 50% uh, of rent related to leisure businesses wasn't paid to the landlords. So it's a huge debt here that's sitting on balance sheets. Now, whilst there are blocks in place, um, those blocks have now been extended to the end of March next year. And that is anticipating uh, some new legislation that's coming in. There is only kind of early drafts that are in circulation at the moment. It hasn't been finalised at the moment. But effectively, what those drafts say is that there will be some form of legal arbitration, legal mediation between landlords and tenants. And that is all focused around COVID related debts around the arrears. So um, those those 
kind of theories, those uh, the ethos behind it is very much to to get the landlords to help support the tenants and share some of the pain of it. Oh, Mark, now, and that's sorry to jump in, but that that Matthew Letts has, has mentioned that as well in the in the chat to say that that those, those uh, tenants will be largely protected protected if that legislation comes in, and that and that's probably going to be right if they participate in that the arbitration. Yeah, certainly the the draft legislation is suggesting that. So I I'm, I suspect it will remain in the final one as well, but we will obviously need to wait and see. Um, but really, that is that is putting a situation in place where there can be some negotiated settlements, and that might be a discount or it might be a payment over an extended period of time. Um, what's kind of feeding into this from the landlord side of things and why it may not be such a huge issue for them is that actually there is a huge amount of flux in the real estate market at the moment. There's a huge amount of uncertainty around things like hybrid working, around the use of office space, around actually the use of cities as a whole. And until that settles down, that uncertainty is kind of pushing through and it's affecting real estate assets, it's affecting asset values and potentially passing rents as well. So at the moment, from a landlord's perspective, if I was sitting there in the landlord's shoes, I'd be quite keen to keep my tenant, even if it meant that I had to take a small discount or if I had to provide a sort of a, a delay for the payment, because I think an empty property at this time is a relatively high risk. Now, what we're seeing from the approach of landlords is kind of two schools of thought. One of them is a bit more bullish about the marketplace than I am. <laughs> And, uh, and is looking at some quite aggressive action and is potentially quite frustrated by the new legislation that's been proposed because they feel that they've been hung out to dry by their tenants. And more often than not, this is where tenants really haven't engaged with them at all during the pandemic, where they have simply sat back and not paid rent, not engaged, not had a conversation about it. More of the landlords, though, I think will be supporting the new legislation that's coming through and are really looking to work with their tenants to come up with a viable solution that protects the tenants business, but also protects the landlords as well. So it has to be an equitable solution here. But I think a lot of the marketplace is actually looking at this on quite a sensible basis and on quite a reasonable basis and trying to look at how you can protect one another in the situation. So just moving on to HMRC. Um, HMRC, very much the voice piece of government through this. They were obviously part of the furlough scheme. They've obviously uh, dealt with the size scheme as well. And we've seen the same kind of approach bleed through into the more day-to-day -day business. So time to base, debt chasing, and obviously the extensions and the possible deferrals of VAT corporation tax as well. All of that has led to very high levels of HMRC debt within businesses. Now, on the face of it, that's all supportive during the course of the pandemic. It does have to be paid at some point, though, obviously. It is part of this COVID debt bomb that we're talking to. HMRC stance there has been more relaxed, partially to support businesses, but also the other side of it is actually from December of last year, Crown Preference came back into play. Now, Crown Preference is a bit of an insolvency sort of uh, specialist subject, so it may not be familiar to all of you. But essentially, within an insolvency, when you're paying out the assets, it goes first to your fixed charge holder, so your bank, and then it goes to preferential creditors. After that, unsecure, uh, sorry, after that, floating charge holders, a separate section of the bank, and then unsecured creditors. So Crown Preference coming back in has effectively jumped the Crown, has jumped HMRC debts from the bottom of the pile up to quite near the top. What that means is they can be more relaxed about collecting monies during the course of the uh, during the course of the solvent business because they've got a higher ranking position in an insolvency. So they can be a little more relaxed here. What do we think we're going to see from the guy forwards? Well, it really is very much a tightening of the approach. They have already made public statements that actually their debt collection processes, their fines processes, their enforcement mechanisms are all going to snap back to pre-COVID type levels. So we are expecting to see them get more aggressive. We are expecting them to do that in a relatively short time frame as well. So if you're going for a time to pay, there will now be requirements to prove affordability again. There will be requirements to provide quite in-depth detail. And also those time to pays, I would expect, will be back in the sort of six to nine month category. During the pandemic, we had seen some that were going out to two years. So just to give a bit of context to it. I think that tightening is going to squeeze liquidity, obviously, because any leeway that you previously had is going to be brought back in. Any deferred tax that you currently have will be brought back in. Um, 
we're also going to see quite aggressive pursuit, I suspect, of what is perceived to be misclaimed support. So businesses that have been using the furlough scheme and uh, there's irregularities or there's anything where the paperwork hasn't been entirely up to date, I think you're going to see quite aggressive pursuit of that. And part of that reason is because there has already been quite a lot of headlines about the level of kind of abuse of these support schemes. Now, bounce back loans are the biggest one that's been catching headlines in terms of fraud and misclaiming and, and claiming and then immediately closing businesses and the like. But I think the, the furlough and the size schemes are going to be high on the radar as well. So it's a really good time at the moment just to be making sure that if you have used these schemes, all the I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed, all the paperwork's in order, because you're far better off served uh, going to HMRC and holding your hands up and saying, apologies, we've got this wrong, this was the error, rather than HMRC coming to you and saying, we think we found something and really getting into an aggressive um, investigation there. So HMRC has been very supportive. I think that probably changes in the relatively near term towards the back end of this year. And I suspect will be a more aggressive stakeholder to be dealing with. On to your suppliers, your general creditors here. Um, so very much looking at trade suppliers, unsecured creditors. In terms of debt levels, actually, we haven't seen huge amounts of supplier debt because there have been far easier levers to pull. It's much easier to not pay your landlord. It's much easier to get a time to pay. It's much easier to get a C bill than it is to stretch those trade suppliers who are critical. In a similar way, the trade suppliers, whilst they've been blocked from presenting winding up petitions, they weren't blocked from ceasing to trade with you. So it's one of those where there's a slight difference between them and the landlords. The landlords couldn't stop you using the building. They can't forfeit the lease. But trade suppliers, there's nothing stopping them turning around and saying, well, I'm just not going to take any orders. You're on stop. So they had a little bit more power during the pandemic. But in general, they've been relatively protected. The level of debt hasn't been particularly material. Other factors, though, are coming into play here. So there are weaknesses in supply chains, and that is partially caused by things like Brexit. So delays in getting goods in from the continent, and we haven't been a kind of insular country in an awfully long time. Almost every supply chain has links to the continent, whether it's one or two or three steps up that chain. So it could be delays, it could be shortages, it could be price rises, it could be inflation. And we'll come on and talk about the employment force as well and the kind of the wage inflation we're seeing. So all of that is putting pressure on liquidity. All of that is putting pressure on being able to afford the debts which are sitting there. One other thing to look at, things like credit insurance and also trading terms with customers and also suppliers. Because as directors of businesses and being on kind of the inside of the business, it's quite easy to look at all of the information that's available, the full management accounts, the strategy that you've got, the plans you've got, the forecasts. And you see far more of the business than anyone else external does. But all of the decisions that are being made are based on the third, on what is publicly available. So it's quite useful as a director to sometimes kind of put some blinkers on and purely look at what is publicly available in a company because it might give a very different perspective. And there's things you can do to help those situations. So you might file your second next year of accounts far quicker than your previous one so that it presents an improved position. There's new information, there's more information available. It could even be having an open discussion with credit insurers or with your customers and sharing some of your forecasting, sharing some of your strategy and your plans. All of that can improve, improve perception. It can improve trading terms. Mention here the prohibition on winding up petitions. As we've said, it falls away at the end of September. So from the 1st of October onwards, uh, unsecured creditors can once more go to the courts and petition for a winding up. There has been new rules that are brought in around that. So it used to be if the debt was £750 or more, you could take it to court. It's now £10,000. Personally, I think that's a much more sensible level. It's more in line with where the world is these days, the £750 limit. I, I can't remember how long it's been there, but it has been decades and decades since that has been updated. So. I think the move to 10,000, whilst it's currently temporary, may well end up being a permanent change. There is also a requirement for the, uh, the creditor to write to the person that owes them the money and give them 21 days to come up with a payment proposal. So similar to the landlord's position, it's very much encouraging 
trade creditors, the unsecured creditors to speak to the people who owe them money and come up with a plan between them, negotiate some kind of a settlement. Again, supporting businesses, it's trying to avoid that flood of insolvencies that has the potential of happening and really prop the businesses up and work together as a business community to really bring it together, which is obviously Chamber of Commerce is all about businesses working together to improve the area. What do we expect in terms of actions from these unsecured creditors? To be honest, I think formal action will be pretty limited, um, notwithstanding the blocks, notwithstanding the encouragement for payment plans and the like. These are unsecured creditors. We've talked already about the huge amount of secured debt, the huge amount of HMRC debt that is now a preference, all of which sits above them. Actually, what is the benefit of going for a winding up petition in this situation? Because the payout for unsecured creditors is likely to be very small because there is a lot of debt sitting ahead of you in that insolvency waterfall. So I don't think we're gonna see a huge amount of formal action from unsecured creditors, from your trade suppliers. I think what we might see is the trading terms being adjusted though. I think you might see some of uh, moving from 30 days down to 21 days or the like, or simply just holding true to those terms. So during the pandemic, everyone has sort of played the get out of jail free card. Oh, we're, my finance team's working from home. It's all a little uncertain. Our processes are changing and those trading terms have slipped out. Credit today's have stretched. So it might be 30 day terms, but payments have been happening on day 35, 36, 37. I think when we get back towards the office and back towards some slightly more normal trading, those are gonna be tightened up. And the expectation will be if it is 30 day terms, you pay by day 30 or you're going on stock by day 32. So I think we're gonna see that tightening and that's gonna be a symptom of just the liquidity pressure that is throughout every business here. Everyone in the supply chain is suffering a little bit. So I think that is just gonna tighten up. Next up, the workforce. I should say at the start of this, I am not an HR lawyer. I'm not an employee rep, so I will keep this relatively brief. Um, staff availability is clearly an issue at the moment. So I work over across in the southeast. We have a lot of orchards. We have a lot of hand-picked fruit over here. And speaking to businesses around me, there is a huge fear as to what is going to actually happen during the harvest period, because they have always been reliant on a migrant workforce, on Eastern Europeans in particular coming across, living here for four months, picking huge amounts of the fruit. Now, firstly, getting them over here is more challenging these days. There is a visa scheme in place for exactly this purpose, but it is a limited number. And secondly, actually the cost of doing that is increasing because of all of the imports and the Brexit and the tax implications of that, the paperwork side of things as much as anything else. Now, the flip side is you say, okay, we'll use British workers instead. Great, lovely, fantastic idea. But the NFU's done a survey last year that looked at the efficiency of British workers. And actually in terms of picking, they were 50% less efficient than the migrant workforce that had been used. So even if you are using British workers, firstly, there's competition to actually get those workers. So wages are going to go, probably going to increase. And secondly, the inefficient, it's inefficient. So you're going to have to employ them for a longer period of time. All of that is squeezing liquidity. Now looking outside of the actual pure availability, businesses and the furlough scheme obviously winding down, businesses need to look at what are their actual needs for staff at the moment. So the market may not have bounced back as quickly as you expect. There may not be work for your entire workforce at the moment. Now, if that's a short term thing, you can probably carry the cost for a month or two, and it's probably worth doing because it will protect the experience within your business. But if that's going to be six months, if that's something like a cruise liner, for example, where you might be trying to sell cruises, but that's not going to happen until next year, potentially because of people's nervousness. Can you afford to be carrying your full staff for that period of time? Or is the cost too high and going to cause liquidity issues? So it's important to be looking ahead, planning ahead. The final two points really around the practical challenges of returning to a workplace. Um, I'm still working from home. Our offices are open, but I haven't spent an awful lot of time in one of them recently. And there's a lot of challenges there in terms of social distancing, in terms of cleaning regimes and the costs involved in that. Is there a vaccination program? Is there a testing program that businesses are going to bring in? And what about the personal expectations of staff? We've been, all been working from home for extended periods of time if you're office based. 
and people have got used to it. I'm certainly used to having kind of breakfast, dinner, and quite possibly lunch with my kids at home and, and enjoying it. If someone turned around and said, I want you back in the office five days a week, it's a difficult conversation to be having. All of those things can be legislated for. You can amend contracts to implement some of these things. But actually, one of the great things an employment lawyer told me recently was, why would you write this into a contract? Why don't you just go and have a conversation with your staff and work out what works for them and what works for you? So I think, again, negotiation here and actually just having that open conversation is really going to help businesses. Last but by no means least, secured lenders. Um, I know we've got uh, we've got a representative from Lumi on the call, so I'll be polite. Um, there's a bit of a split market in terms of lenders at the moment. So all lenders throughout the pandemic have been hugely supportive. Um, they have all very much towed the government's line, but also they have done the best thing for their customers. So we have seen an awful lot of support. We've seen an awful lot of freedom given, an awful lot of um, deferrals of payments, additional lending, all of which has helped support these businesses. What we have seen over the last kind of three or six months is actually businesses coming back for a second round of lending. So they took their C-bill early in the expectation lockdowns would have finished by kind of October of last year. But then what they found is there's further lockdowns, there's further impingements, the market hasn't come back as quickly as they expected. And we've seen a lot of businesses go back to their banks and say, actually, I need another 100,000, I need another 200,000, I need another half a million pounds to see me through the end of this period and also that wind back up and repriming the pumps to get back out into the marketplace. A lot of times that's quite a challenging conversation. We've had quite a lot of lenders come to us and ask us to do what we call pre-lend reviews. So looking at a business, looking at their forecasts and coming up with a view that says, is this affordable or not? What is affordable? How can we structure it in a way that is best to support the business, but also protect the lender? Generally, those have been supported. And I would also say there is debt financing available across the board at the moment. So the split in the marketplace really comes down to the large clearing banks on the one side who have deployed huge amounts of capital during the course of the pandemic. They're less deal hungry at the moment. They still want to be out in the marketplace. They still are out in the marketplace. But what we're seeing is they tend to be more risk averse because they've put so much capital out the door. They're tending to really only go for the, the really good side of the business. On the other side of that, you've got some of the more challenger banks, some of the sort of uh, the Shawbrooks, the Oak Norths and the like, all of whom are very, very keen to deploy capital at the moment. They probably had less of the, uh, of the kind of COVID pie, the C-bill pie during the pandemic itself. And all of them are very active in the marketplace and they are willing to take on higher risks than some of the clearing banks are. So what do we expect to see in terms of actions from these secured lenders? Well, from, uh, from all of them, if you have a good business, if it was trading well pre-pandemic and it's taken sensible steps to manage costs during the pandemic and it's now showing green shoots coming out the other side, the entire market is open to you. The entire market will be there. Where you've got a slightly more challenged business, and it might have been good pre-pandemic, but has really suffered during the pandemic, and now the market is slow coming back, those are going to see a bit more of this split. So I think the clearing banks, the big four, are probably going to be a little bit shy and a little bit wary and prefer you to go somewhere else. I think the challenger banks are absolutely there for you and absolutely keen to lend. But what you will probably find is that whilst they're keener to lend now, they're also a little bit sharper in terms of their enforcement. The big clearing banks have a terror of kind of the headlines, the red tops, um, and that kind of public perception of them. So they tend to be very slow to enforce. They tend to be very supportive. The worst that you get from a clearing bank will be them largely sort of sitting back and saying, this is your problem. We're not putting any more money out the door to support you. You need to do whatever it is you need to do at this point in time. I think the, the challenger banks, the second kind of the, the second tier, as it were, are more likely to be more aggressive. They're more likely to actually look at, OK, well, we're not going to put more money out the door, but this is how we're going to work through the problem. This is how I need to protect my own balance sheet here. So I think you're going to see a more aggressive stance from those challenger banks. Across the board here, I think 
most of these, with the exception of HMRC, most of these stakeholders are going to be quite supportive of business. They're going to look at ways of actually working with customers, working with businesses to try and protect, support and protect. But that goes for businesses who are making correct decisions, who are making sensible decisions and who are showing that they are still viable businesses. So I think generally negotiation and support is kind of the watchword here. That's a quick look at what the stakeholders are thinking and what they're potentially doing. James is now going to uh, take over and talk about what directors can be doing to support businesses through this as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. That was excellent. Um, so if we take a step back now and have a think about what businesses could be doing now, what steps could they be taking? And, and what do we have in our post-pandemic toolkit as restructuring advisors? Well, as Mark mentioned, there are a huge number of issues for clients to consider uh, from the perspective of their, their, their stakeholders and the, and the potential increase in insolvency volumes and unpredictable competing interests of those stakeholders means that proactive planning is essential. So the legislative protections have nearly expired. So if you have any concerns regarding your business or your client's business, now is the right time to take a step back and recommend that they, they fully uh, understand and contemplate the whole business environment, how that affects them and how resilient their business will be if there are any bumps in the road ahead. So really companies should consider their stakeholders, who the key stakeholders are. That could be certain suppliers or customers, lenders, key staff, shareholders, or even pension trustees. It sh should take some time to review the stakeholders, the risk that stakeholder might pose to their business if they fail or if they become aggressive and the vulnerability that stakeholder has if, if your business fails. In addition to the value that the stakeholder may have to the company in a distressed situation. So there are always stakeholders that have some skin in the game that their um, interests and the company's interests are aligned and you really want to identify that because they can make the difference between success or failure if there are some bumps in the road. The next point is regarding the, the financial information and that's absolutely crucial since that will help keep the company appraised of the short and medium term cash requirements and the risk of any liquidity issues. So it's really important that uh, customers, uh, uh, sorry, clients and companies consider more than one scenario when looking at their cash requirements so they can clearly understand how their working capital will be impacted by any issues such as those flagged by Mark. Understanding their cash needs and any potential shortfalls is going to be a crucial part of successfully navigating out of the pandemic. And the quality of the financial information, as any lenders on the call will be able to attest to, is going to make a significant difference to a lender's perception of a company. And that will put the company on the front foot when it comes to a refinancing proposal. So as we often say in these presentations, early action and advice is key to maximizing turnaround options. It can protect directors and shareholders from the risk of person, uh, personal liability. And critically, it preserves the goodwill with the stakeholders that will be critical for any restructuring plan. And we'll come on to that. And the final point on here is to speak with one of us, a restructuring advisor at the first sign of distress. So we can give you our thoughts. So on the next slide, we see how we can help. Now, there are a whole plethora of ways that um, a restructuring advisor or firm or firms such as RSM can help. And they're set out on this slide. And that shows the full range of support that we can offer at the various stages on the decline curve of a business. Uh, but don't worry, I won't run through every single one. I would, I would just emphasize that we're expecting consensual restructuring, which is circled in blue there, to be at the forefront of supporting businesses over the coming year. If we're contacted uh, earlier enough, early enough, then there shouldn't be any need for more severe measures. Um, and the earlier, as you can see on this slide, the earlier we become involved, the greater the opportunity there is to save the company. And this slide deck will be available to anybody who wants it after the call. They should just um, list, let us know. So on the next slide, we have a, a look at the sort of work that a restructuring advisor can do to support a business. And this is, um, this is the sort of you know, preparatory work that could also be done by the company itself. So a key focus at the early stage is obviously to quickly ensure we understand clearly um, what the business, how the business model works, um, it's, who its management are and the shareholders are, understand what drives that business and what the objectives are of the key individuals. Uh, the next stage we put on here um, 
is that we work very closely with the directors and any existing advisors to get our arms around the financial position, analyze the cash flow and the balance sheet, identify the work and capital need and the business's longer term profitability as it comes out of the other side of the pandemic. Where is it hoping to get to? So once we've completed stage two, at stage three, we identify the key stakeholders, which will potentially include employees, funders, customers, suppliers, HMRC, shareholders, and potentially pension trustees. As mentioned earlier, there are gonna be a, a large number of players connected to the business that are gonna have a significant interest in making sure that the business avoids insolvency. And understanding who they are, their motivation, and what role they can play in a solution is gonna be pivotal, pivotal sorry, to finding a, a credible solution which can win their support. At point four here, we, are, we help the company to identify any easy wins, which could include refinancing, uh, tax refunds, government release. There are a whole range of easy wins that can often go missed uh, when, when the, the client is, is, is just charging through trying to get from day to day. And once we've completed all of that, we're really at stage five, where we're equipped to evaluate the key contingency planning options that are most appropriate for that company. And these options will nearly always prioritize a consensual restructuring. And then that, and that can be structured using the information and analysis that's been derived during this process. And we've also listed on the slide uh, the options which can be needed in more severely distressed situations, such as SEGA restructuring plan, CVA, prepack, administration, etc. But we'll focus on consensual restructuring for now. So, so what does that look like? So consensual restructuring involves working with the company, its existing advisors and stakeholders to win their support for a mutually beneficial restructuring solution. We need to quickly understand the business model, assess any funding need, understand motivations and objectives, and the company's interaction with those stakeholders. We also assess as a key part of this, what a credible nuclear fallback option would look like uh, and how it would be implemented because and that is often an insolvency or a formal restructuring scenario. And we look at what the outcome would be for each of the key stakeholders in that scenario. Because then we can formulate a consensual solution to carry the company clear of its current financial difficulties, which may require the support and forbearance of the key stakeholders. But we will be able to demonstrate that it is a clear improvement on that nuclear fallback scenario to help motivate the stakeholders to buy into that solution. And the goodwill of the stakeholders obviously, is obviously key here. And that's why we emphasize the need to act early to minimize the erosion of that goodwill as the company becomes distressed. As the company goes through a period of distress, they are gonna lean more on, on those stakeholders and that goodwill is likely to diminish. So that's why we wanna move early and make sure we get the messaging right. So some simple examples of what can form part of a restructuring solution. Sorry, if you could just go back a slide, sorry, Mark. Um, so some sim simple examples of what can form part of a restructuring solution are shown on the right hand side of that slide and that can include agreeing profit based rents with landlords, negotiating fresh covenants and funding structures with lenders, agreeing comprehensive time to pay agreements with HMRC and negotiating special terms with key suppliers or customers. There are a whole array of potential factors which can contribute to a successful consensual restructuring plan. And the key is going to be winning the support of the stakeholders and ensuring that there is a clear credible and consistent messaging to ensure they've got full com uh, confidence in the in the integrity and the e efficacy of the proposed restructuring plan. So you've gone through that whole process, you've put together uh, a, a, you know, the best option available in the circumstances, you've set out the fact that you know if they don't go for that option then the fallback option is going to look much darker for them and yet still you might end up uh, with an unreasonable response from one or two stakeholders who think they can blackmail you through um, and, and get a get a get an enhanced response and even in those circumstances there are still options available to save the company uh, through a non-consensual restructuring process and that's on the next slide so this legislation came into force uh, last year and that can force an equitable solution on all stakeholders the SEGA restructuring plan enables dissenting stakeholders to be forced to accept a compromise, also being called crammed down, as we mentioned on the slide, uh, as long as the company can convince a court that the proposed plan is fair and the best available solution in the circumstances. So that means that not only dissenting suppliers and landlords are bound by the proposal, but secured creditors, HMRC, and even dissenting shareholders can be bound by that plan. And it can be, therefore, that can be used as a powerful tool to attract parties uh, that might be prepared to inject the high-risk funding 
that is needed to save a distressed business. If that funding comes in knowing that it can take an equity stake, because really it's taking an equity risk at that sort of stage, then it makes it more likely for that to be successful. And one of the most successful, I mean, sorry, helpful aspects of this legislation is actually for the consensual restructuring process. And that's because it gives additional leverage, leverage uh, with the stakeholders. If we're able to, state, to say to the stakeholders, look, this is the best plan available in the circumstances, uh, this is what we're putting to you. But actually, um, if you're not prepared to accept this consensually, we will be forced to go through this restructuring plan option or an alternative option, which will force you to accept a solution. It makes them far more likely uh, to, to accept it. It's uh, a great incentive. And in the bottom half of this slide, in the bottom half of the slide, we talk about company furniture arrangements, which is a more conventional restructuring method, uh, also called CVAs. Um, and they, these have been around for a long time and we expect them to be widely used as part of restructurings as we come out of the pandemic as well. So a CVA can be used to force a solution on trade creditors and landlords in order to strengthen the balance sheet and improve liquidity. But as we state on the slide, a CVA can only compromise unsecured creditors and it needs a consensual solution to be reached with shareholders, secured creditors and HMRC now that they've got preferential status. So those are the preferred non-consensual restructuring options. And the, and the next slide shows you uh, prepack administrations, which you may have heard of before. They're really, they're really a last resort to save the business where the company is ir irreparably insolvent. So this saves the underlying business assets and jobs by moving them across to a purchaser in a new company or a different company. And it leaves all the creditors in the old company, which remains in administration and is dissolved. So thank you for bearing with us. That was a very high level summary of the key steps businesses can take and the tools available to us as we emerge in the post pandemic world. I'm conscious we've covered a great deal of uh, ground this morning. So the next slide just touches on the key points I think that we, we you know, we'd like you to take away. So as we've mentioned, the bounce back from COVID, the bounce back from COVID will present substantial opportunities over the next 12 to 18 months, but there are also gonna be a lot of pitfalls. Businesses have accrued huge debts onto their balance sheets, and they've been able to kick the can down the road for critical decisions over the last year, which are now coming back into focus as those protections unwind. So directors must ensure that they've got plans in, deal, in place to deal with those huge debts and the strategic decisions on the horizon, including trying to predict some of the actions that might be taken by some of their key stakeholders. And each of those stakeholders are facing their own pressures, whether related to strategy, finance, or public relations, However, overall, we do see a desire to work together and with the right messaging, uh, stakeholders and the company can align their interests and put together an equitable solution which shares the pains and gains of a situation uh, to help all parties move forward successfully. But to get there, directors need to engage early. First, internally, to ensure their strategy and financial information is in order. Like with the, likely with the support of their existing advisors and possibly restructuring specialists. And secondly, externally, to ensure stakeholders are engaged with the right messaging from the start, not simply delivered an ultimatum for late in the day. And throughout the process, clear, consistent, incredible communication is critical. As uh, the saying goes, uh, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And stakeholders will give short shrift to those that they see are being opportunistic, and those that repeatedly fail to deliver on promises, and those who don't believe uh, that, that the other side are being open and honest in those initial approaches. So the overriding message from all of this is act early for the best chance of a positive outcome. As mentioned earlier, speak with one of us at the first sign of distress, and even if you're unsure whether it's necessary, we'll always happily discuss the situation with you at no cost initially to help determine whether actually your company needs our assistance. So a huge thank you for listening. Um, and we would now welcome any questions that you might have. I appreciate it's a huge amount to, to take in. So if, if you don't have any questions now, um, obviously we're very happy to take, take a call or any questions by email after the event. Um, and as I said, the, you know, the slides will, uh, will be available for this. So just drop us a line if you think um, they would be helpful. That's great. Thank you very much, James and Mark, for delivering today's webinar on diffusing the COVID debt bomb. Um, it's been very interesting listening to you guys. Um, 
an interesting topic and area of business that you've actually educated us on today um, and it's been very engaging. So the webinar has been recorded so you can listen to it again and as I mentioned at the beginning you can share the link amongst your, um, your team um, and that's available on the Chamber webinar library so that's under the event section on the, on the website. Um, if you do have any questions uh, delegates please post them in the chat box and Mark and James will answer those for you. Um, I have a question actually. <laughs> so just referring to the slide that um, Mark uh, spoke about, so referring to the workforce, um, does it mean that there will be new workforce strategies for uh, both short-term actions and long-term vision for recovery? I think there has to be in short. Um, I think the any any view that says we're going to come out of this and everything will be exactly as it was before immediately mm. is uh, is quite unlikely. So I think there has to be a plan. All businesses should be looking at their marketplaces and kind of working out what you need in the next three months, six months, nine months. And you probably are looking at 12 to 18 months before we actually get back to normal, whatever normal may be at those times. Mm. So I, I absolutely think there's different timescales that this needs to be looked at. And are you actually seeing any businesses at the moment facing any um, challenges with their, their workforce coming uh, or returning back to the office? Um, quite simply, yes. Uh, even even on a personal level, I, I deal with <laughs> some of the HR issues for RSM South region. And I've had discussions with all of our staff and their views range from I never want to see the inside of an office again to... Wow. I want to be there five days a week and I hate working from home. So just balancing those personal perspectives across a team of, I mean, our, our Guildford office is about 30 people, our Southampton office is slightly larger, but there's there's a lot of different views and, and finding a strategy that works for the business and works for the individuals is obviously quite challenging. Mm, okay, thank you. Okay, um, I can't see any questions in the chat box, um, but we're still here, so you can please... Um, you can still post your questions. Um, I'm just going to move over to the next slide. Um, oh, actually, questions just popped up. Um, Mark, James, can you see that? Yeah, um, a tightening of the availability of invoice finance facilities post green cell. Um, it's not something that I've seen, and I'm, I'm on the sort of uh, invoice financing committee at RSM. Um, so no, it's not something that that I. I've noted a direct impact. Um, what I have noticed is some of the the, the um, high street banks, but just being generally a bit more cautious. And I think they they are alive to the unpredictable unpredictable nature of trading post pandemic. So not directly related to green seal, but I think related to the pandemic. And as such, they 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 are being a little bit more cautious. I think on the invoice financing side, um, but some of the the mid tier uh invoice financing specialists and abl uh, asset-based lending specialists um who who uh are perhaps a bit perhaps a bit more um flexible um i think are are, are, are starting to really pick up pace invoice financing is going to be a really useful uh funding tool for businesses as they come out of the pandemic because the the size of the facility grows with uh, sales so I actually think that's going to be a, a business, a, a, a funding line, which which we see sort of grow with the economy. But no, no, no direct tightening as a result of of the uh, of green sale. Okay, great. Thank you, James. Okay, another question from Tom um, Elman. Elman, sorry. So, unemployment rising significantly post furlough. Um, it's not something I've seen yet. Mark, do you have any views on that? No, at the moment, most businesses seem to be trying to carry their workforce with them. So we certainly haven't seen any huge spikes. To be honest, if you were going to see unemployment, the chances are it would have happened back in June because the cost has been increasing over the last three months. So if you were expecting to make redundancies, you probably would have made them earlier rather than later. So I, I don't think we're going to see huge spikes in unemployment, um, particularly with the mar demand for workforce as well at the moment. I think I think we may see it just sort of ticking along as normal. It's interesting. I mean, I, I'm not one to, to often say positive things about politicians, but but the uh, Rishi, seems, Rishi Sunak seems to have put in place measures 
with the support, obviously, of his team in the legislature, um, which has smoothed the rise of unemployment and also smoothed the um, the number of insolvencies. I think without the legislation that, that, that's been put in, we would have seen quite a different outcome. Uh, but really, it's I said a bit unkindly that it's kicked it down the road. It has to a degree, but probably necessarily so. Uh, and it's meant that there probably isn't going to be the cliff edge that there otherwise would have been. Okay, that's great. Okay, I'm just going to quickly move over to the next slide. Um, and I, I, I can see we're getting... Okay, so not questions at the moment, but Tom said thank you both. Very informative and well presented. So thank you very much. Give, give praise. Keep it coming. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> okay, so just going to quickly touch on some chamber slides here. Um, so here is our membership tiers. Um, so there's different um, tiers for membership here. Um, if you are a member, then you will obviously be in one of those tiers. Um, if you'd like to learn more about them, um, and just want to get a more of an insight or an overview of what's available, then contact your account manager and um, he or she will be able to answer your questions or queries with you. If you are not a, a member, so a non-member, you can contact myself um, and I will um, discuss membership with you, the benefits and opportunities available. Um, that's my contact details there. I'm also sharing contact details for James and Mark. Um, if you've got any questions regarding um, their webinar today. Um, they have shared um, the post-pandemic toolkit, which was very useful. Um, and you can view that again um, if you go back on the webinar recording on our webinar library. Um, and I remember, James, you mentioned that they can the delegates can contact you to get a, a copy of that. Is that right? By all means, yeah, I'd be delighted if they drop me an email, james.hawksworth at rsmuk.com, or even give me a call on the mobile. Uh, very happy to talk anything through and, and, and to provide them with a, with a copy of the slide deck. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Right. Okay. So once again, if you do have any questions, um, I've got a minute or so. Um, I think we, we've literally just done the hour, but I will give it another minute if anyone's got any questions. Um, yeah, so so thank you very much, uh, Mark and James, again, for delivering today's webinar. It's been great having you guys here um, and educating us on, on a really interesting area of business. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Miranda. It's been a pleasure. We really appreciate you hosting the event. You're welcome. Um, just got a few messages coming in, just um, some delegates acknowledging your um, your webinar. And yeah, so we will, um, yeah, as I mentioned, um, the, the, the webinar is has been recorded and you can listen to it again on the webinar library. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for listening in. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks all. Okay, bye.